Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome Max Rudinsky uh, give us a talk about manifold learning. This is a uh, paper that he just presented at NIPS last week as an oral presentation. And Max is currently at uh, the Beckman Institute, UIUC, on a three-year postdoctoral fellowship. OK. So, um, so this is joint work with um, Svetlana Lezevnik. As, um, as um, Rick just mentioned, uh, it was presented last week at NIPS, and you get here the enhanced um, and um, more free-flowing version. So let's start by defining the problem. Um, so with increasing emphasis on sort of multimedia processing, especially high-volume um, data sets, uh, we need to find efficient ways of compressing and storing and analyzing it, and even for visualization. So um, in many cases, it's natural to make the assumption that the data set has some underlying low-dimensional structure. So for example, let's take a class of images taken of some you know, uh, given scene category. And um, the raw dimension of, that, of the vector space that these images occupy is, uh, is enormous. Just for, for, for each pixel, you'd have the, the range of um, values the intensity can take. And so you can imagine how big that is. But because these images were taken um, with similar modality in mind, it's natural to make the assumption that there's some smooth underlying structure to this data set that allows us to describe it with um, many fewer components, many fewer dimensions. And um, if we find what that number of dimensions is, then we can reduce the dimension using some nonlinear dimensionality reduction techniques and cut down on complexity, or even maybe gain some insight into the structure of the space, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so the question is, well, if we assume that um, the data are uh, located on a smooth manifold embedded in a high dimensional space, and we, and we have a large number of the IID samples from that manifold, how do we estimate this intrinsic dimension of, of the manifold, so the low number of parameters needed to describe it? And just to, so to put it in context, I like to give this example of nonlinear dimensionality reduction. Um, there's a venerable you know, method of, um, of speech coding called linear predictive coding, which um, takes a frame of speech and, and um, fits uh, an autoregressive Gaussian process to it, and then represents um, the frame of speech, which has you know, a large dimension, twice the time bandwidth product by just a few filter coefficients. So, and, and, then, uh, and then the filter coefficients can be quantized and transmitted. And then at the decoder, you reconstruct, it synthesize the speech using these filter coefficients. So this is a lossy representation, but it's good enough for certain purposes. And it's a nonlinear dimensionality reduction technique, because you go from a huge dimension to potentially a very small one. And um, in other areas, you, these days, you can, you can envision that as well. Um, and compressing medical images and trying to identify the salient parameters in there. So that's an important problem. But there are also two sub, um, related problems. So, well, if we want to compress this manifold data, um, how do we determine the right compression rate? The right compression rate meaning that since this data is located on a low dimensional surface, surface in a high dimensional space, um, the compression scheme should respect this low dimensional structure and be adapted to it. So um, if the rate is too high, um, it could be possible that, in fact, what we're doing is we're compressing the noise that's inherent um, in, in, in the data acquisition. Or if the, and if the uh, rate is too low, then we're, uh, we're just compressing. And if we're doing it from number of samples, we're compressing individual samples, uh, compressing something that's, that's um, <clears throat> That's really um, really dense, and we don't have enough um, enough fidelity in the in the reconstruction. And finally, so and, and the related um, question to that is how do we design a compression scheme whose partition cells would actually correspond to low-dimensional local coordinate systems of the manifold? That's the, the, the most interesting problem. Um, and it turns out that all these three problems are related, and they can all be addressed using um, high-rate vector quantization. Um, so uh, the previous work in dimensionality reduction, this is actually uh, you know, uh, 
has a long history. And um, I could tra trace it back to 1969, the work of Bennett. Uh, and uh, there's been continuous work in this field. Um, Grasberger and Percaccia, for example, did in the con context of fractals and dynamical systems. And then uh, starting about 2000, um, this has been related to learning, statistical learning of data located on manifolds. And so the um, works of Camastro and Shirelli, Brand, Kegel, Costin Harrow, and Levin and Bickel are just a sampling of um, uh, approaches for estimating the dimension of, of, of manifolds from samples um, in the manifold learning community. So the key idea behind all of these methods basically is that for data that are uniformly distributed on a low dimensional sub manifold, and it has to be smooth, compact submanifold of a high dimensional space, the probability of a small ball of sufficiently small radius epsilon uh, around any point in the manifold is uh, big theta of um, epsilon raised to the I intrinsic dimension of the manifold. So big theta is a standard computer science type asymptotic notation. It just means that this probability can be bounded from, a, from above and from below by constants times this um, epsilon to uh, little d. And this property can be generalized um, so any probability distribution that possesses this property for sufficiently small um, radii is called regular of dimension um, lowercase d. So um, a uniform distribution on a manifold is a prime example of a regular distribution. But uh, you can think of um, other examples as well. They're fairly natural in geometric modeling. So this assumption is made often implicitly. And, um, and when you only uh, have finitely many samples, you have to estimate these probabilities from um, from, say, nearest neighbors uh, or kth nearest neighbor distances. And then you do some regression modeling or maybe um, some maximal, maximum likelihood fitting and determine this parameter, uh, low dim uh, this low case d. But these methods um, suffer from some uh, drawbacks. Well, one of them is that they tend to exhibit negative bias. In other words, they tend to underestimate the number of uh, parameters needed to describe the data. And um, this negative bias is especially apparent in um, high extrinsic dimensions. Um, <clears throat> and um, behavior in the presence of noise is not systematically analyzed. So most of the studies of um, the effect of noise are kind of heuristic. They add some Gauss Markov noise, for example, and study the effect of that. But there are no bounds on how the system performs uh, in the presence of noise. Well, um, we propose an approach based on high resolution vector quantization that can handle um, uh, these problems. If not solve them completely, then at least remove some of the obvious sources of these difficulties and in a systematic and principled way. So the key idea behind, um, behind our method is that when the data lying in a d-dimensional submanifold of, a, of a, a high dimensional space, and you use here the convention that the intrinsic dimension is denoted by lowercase d and the extrinsic dimension is denoted by uppercase d. So when, when the data are optimally vector, vector quantized with a large number k of code vectors, the quantizer error scales approximately as um, constant times the number of quantizer levels raised to minus one over the intrinsic dimension. Um, this is the quantizer error. Well, just to 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 um, um, to foresee the, the discussion. This is a, a quantizer error, which means that well, we'll define it um, mathematically very soon. Uh, but the point is that this this functional form immediately suggests an estimator for the intrinsic dimension, which uses in fact the compressibility properties of uh, of this manifold. So the advantage is that, well, once we connect it to vector quantization, there's a host of techniques that you can use to, to, um, to design very um, good, close to optimum um, schemes of vector quantization from, from, from training samples. And, um, and this uh, can be used to ensure statistical consistency, in particular by using a test sequence to estimate um, these distortions. And, and then we can also analyze the effect of additive noise in a, in a simple, um, systematic manner. So just um, to set the stage for vector quantization, so um, a d-dimensional k-point vector quantizer is a map qk, and so it just maps high-dimensional vectors x to um, one of k-code vectors y sub i, also living in the same extrinsic embedding space. And um, Logarithm of k is the quantizer rate, and we assume that binary logarithms everywhere, and this quantizer rate in, in, in bits per vector. So to measure the quality of the reconstruction, we assume that the data x are distributed according to some distribution mu, and we fix the parameter r, which um, 
here ranges um, between 1 and infinity. And um, that's the, called the distortion exponent. And um, so the distortion is basically the rth power of the Euclidean distance between the, between the data point and its image under the quantizer. Um, and we also denote it by um, rho sub r. So r is this free parameter which, uh, which, which can, we can choose. And, um, <clears throat> and um, for convenience, we can then take the rth root of that expectation, and that's called the average error. Uh, we're going to denote it by e sub r, and this is the error due to the quantizer um, qk on data distributed according to mu. And then we can look at optimality. So we'll look at the set of all possible k-dimensional a uh, d-dimensional k-point vector quantizers, and then minimize this error um, over the set. And this is the optimum um, performance of any k-point vector quantizer on the given data set. So with these uh, notations in place, let's proceed um, about this interesting thing called the quantization dimension. And the mathematical setting here is that m is a smooth, compact, lowercase d-dimensional manifold embedded in um, capital D dimensions. And mu is the regular probability distribution on M. So the regularity I've already defined, and this is um, what it means. The probability of a small ball of radius epsilon is big theta of epsilon raised to the um, intrinsic dimension. We don't know what the intrinsic dimension is, but we assume that whatever it is, the distribution is regular uh, and satisfies this property. Now, um, <clears throat> the nice result in the, in the theory of vector quantization is when you um, when the, the rate is really, really high, um, the partition cells of the quantizer can be approximated by balls around the code vectors. And then you can use some geometric um, um, reasoning, measure theoretic kind of stuff uh, with um, integrals, and, and show that the optimal VQ error for, a, for any distortion exponent, we're taking rth roots here of the, of the distortion, uh, for any k-point quantizer, satisfies um, this asymptotic relation. And um, this was um, exploited by um, Alzador in, um, well, 1982 was when um, this paper based on his PhD thesis research, right, was published in the special issue of IT transactions on, uh, on <clears throat> special issue on vector quantization. So he defined this quantization dimension of this probability distribution mu of uh, order r as this limit right here. Uh, as the uh, quantizer rate goes to infinity, you look at the ratio of the logs. So, so the ratio of the rate to the log of the error, and then you take the minus sign to account for this exponent. And that, uh, and that um, captures this, the asymptotics of, um, of the distortion of the high rate quantizer. Uh, and this was, in fact, an analyzed further in great, great detail for all sorts of situations in this uh, monograph by Graf and Lushby in 2000. Uh, and the fact that we will need is that under these conditions, this um, rth order quantization dimension exists for all orders between 1 and infinity. In fact, in the limit of as r goes to infinity, it also exists. And for all these orders, it's equal to the intrinsic dimension of the manifold. And um, so this is how we're going to proceed. So just the difference between our approach and the VQ literature. In VQ literatures, in particular, Zador assumed that um, this dimension is known. And therefore, this limit just allows you to track the asymptotic behavior of the distortion. And we assume the opposite. We assume that we can estimate these distortions from data. Or we don't know the dimension. But once we know that um, the dimension is given by this limit, we, we can use some sort of um, linear regression <coughs> techniques to estimate it. And um, well, once we start with um, working with empirical data, this is um, what the algorithm, well, this is what the definition suggests. So we'll start with a training sequence um, sampled in an independent fashion from a manifold. And we have a, also an independent test sequence also sampled from a manifold. So for a total of n plus m samples, we can, you, know, you can just sample a whole lot of points and split them and, and then do a cross-validation type um, um, setup, which is, in fact, what we did. But anyway, um, we fix a range of code book sizes k for which the, um, the high rate approximation can be expected to be valid. I mean, this is, and this is, of course, sort of a practical point. How do we do that if we don't know um, what the dimension is? Well, we can use sort of a heuristic um, fact that typically high rate approximation holds a few for each additional dimension. You get like a constant number of bits of rate. 
And um, since this really is low dimensional data, uh, you'll only need an expon ex exponentially many um, code vectors in the intrinsic dimension, which is typically going to be much, much, much lower than the extrinsic dimension. So uh, if you sweep something like from 6 to, say, you know, 15 bits um, uh, per vector over this range, you should be OK, uh, at least in the, in the data sets that we have um, investigated. So, you, fi so you, you pick this range of code book sizes, and then for each code book size in the range, you train, you learn um, an empirically optimal quantizer, uh, QK hat, to minimize this, this is the empirical um, average of the distortion. So this is a standard um, empirical quantizer design. Um, and then once you learn this quantizer, so you would use a descent algorithm, like the Lloyd algorithm or the you know, LBG algorithm, uh, you, you then test this quantizer on the test set and uh, then approximate this optimal quantization error by, um, by this average. So now uh, this quantizer is obtained. This quantizer is a function of the training set. So, and then you uh, run this um, um, quantizer on an independent testing set and use the law of large numbers to, to basically say, well, this is going to be close to um, the test distortion of this um, QK. In other words, if I take a QK hat and run it on some independent sample, this will approximate what that distortion will be. And then if this empirical quantizer design algorithm is good, then this will also give me a good approximation of um, the, uh, the um, optimal quantizer for mu in the limit of um, large training set. And then finally, once we do this for, um, for all the uh, code book sizes in the range, we uh, plot um, the rate versus minus log of the error and then determine um, the intrinsic dimension from the slope of this plot over the chosen range of k. And, uh, a good sanity check to see whether the high rate approximation really holds is that the plot should be very close to linear. Uh, because then, um, because then um, this high rate approximation will, will, uh, will be substantiated, and this limit will, in fact, give us the, the, the right number. So um, any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Am I being clear? OK. So the important thing is the statistical consistency built in to, to, to our method by virtue of using empirical vector quantizer design. Um, <clears throat> so of course, when you minimize this training error, uh, we need to do that uh, because um, that gives us at least locally optimal approximation to the optimal quantizer from mu. But we cannot use the training error directly as an estimate of the optimal distortion because the training error um, is an optimistically biased estimate of this distortion. It has to do with the fact that well, basically, um, it's a high rate quantizer. So um, the training ratio, meaning the ratio of the training set size to the, to the code book size, um, would be fairly small. So this quantizer has a good chance to over overfit the training set and therefore fail to generalize to the test set. So we have to be careful there. And, um, and plus, you know, what, what this empirically designed quantizer does, it just learns the, the, learns the training set. That's all it really does. It zeroes in on the training set, and therefore um, the distortion on that training set will obviously be lower than the real um, <clears throat> average distortion of this same quantizer. So that's why we have to get the we have to get the test sequence uh, and then estimate um, this um, optimal distortion from the test sequence. And um, so the idea is that well, we have this quantizer from the from the training stages. QK hat. We want to estimate this. So we want to see how this quantizer will just on average perform on the data distributed according to mu. And then just this empirical distribution is a good approximation to mu by law of large numbers of the glivenko contelli type arguments. And therefore, um, this equality approximately holds. And then statistical consistency holds because the test distortion of the empirically optimal quantizer approaches the optimal distortion in the limit of um, the uh, training set size goes to, going to infinity. So this provides uh, a guarantee of statistical consistency of our scheme, at least to the extent that the um, empirical quantizer design found a good, a decent uh, approximation to the, to the optimal quantizer. Um, and just to show off our results, um, so the, um, this um, distortion exponent will set it to 2 which makes the distortion measure um, into standard squared error Euclidean um, measure. And therefore, the quantizer design algorithm is just the standard what they call k-means. 
uh, it's very sim simple to implement. Um, so we ran it on two, two manifolds, synthetically generated. So uh, the Swiss roll, which is a standard sort of standard test set in, uh, in uh, manifold learning literature. It's just a plane rolled up and embedded in three-dimensional space. Um, so we collected 20,000 samples and used them in a five-fold, I think, cross-validation setup. Uh, and these are the averaged training and test um, curves. So uh, on the um, x-axis here, we have minus log of the quantizer error for the training. Training is the red and test is the black. And uh, on the y-axis, I believe, we have the rate. And um, just to see that the um, high rate approximation holds, we know the ground truth. We know that the intrinsic dimension of this manifold is 2. So we fit the training and the test this, um, <coughs> errors to, to, um, to these functional forms. So the training um, distortion was fit to this form. So this is the right um, high rate um, type term. And there are constants here. And there's an additive constant here, which is negative. This is done to account for the fact that since this is an empirically designed quantizer, what's going to happen is that when I make the number of codebook vectors equal to the number of training samples, the quantizer will just pick each training sample to be a code vector and give me zero distortion. And uh, that's no good. Uh, and um, in the test set, the additive constant is, is positive, because what's going to happen is as the training ratio decreases. So when uh, the codebook size really, really begins to approximate the training sequence size, um, the test, the, the, the training error starts decreasing to zero, but the test error will start increasing because of this generalization failure. So we have to really capture the sweet spot. We have to look at um, the regime in which these um, two errors are um, are fairly close, and there's a good linear fit to this plot. So what we did then to estimate the dimension is um, <clears throat> so we obtained, the, uh, obtained these two plots, and um, we did a linear, linear fit uh, for both of them. And, and we'll look at the residual of the linear fit for the testing and the, tra uh, and the training distortions here and here, and basically pick the first minimum of the slope um, of these plots um, in, in the region where um, the, tr the, the training and the test um, error residuals are still very close to each other. And what, what this does is we, we make sure we stay in the region where um, the quantizer still um, captures the right distribution of the data, but still is not yet too bad that, you know, you move a bit away from it, and it'll begin to wildly overgeneralize, uh, wildly overfit uh, the training set. <clears throat> so our estimate um, of the intrinsic dimension was 2.1, so just a bit higher than the actual true intrinsic dimension. Um, so that's good. Uh, and um, well, another interesting feature of our methods is we tried in this toroidal spiral, which is a one-dimensional surface, but if you uh, look at it with a bit less resolution, you'll sort of see the loops blur together and you see a two-dimensional torus. So for <coughs> lower rates, we actually capture the two-dimensional structure, which is in fact not the high rate approximation for, the, for, for, this, for this distribution. But apparently when the rate is, is, is low enough, uh, the quantizer can pretend that it sees a two-dimensional surface. But when the rate gets really high, then we get the, you know, the nice um, one-dimensional um, estimate. Uh, of, of the data. So again, the estimates are a bit, a bit higher than, than the, the true dimension. So that, that leads us to su suggest that we've removed most of the sources of negative bias in our estimate, estimates. Is there, for the torus, is there a regime where if you look at it with even coarser, with balls that are on the size of about the width of the torus, that it would come back to a one-dimensional approximation, basically just find the single... Oh, you mean the... the, the I, we haven't tried that, um, but that I'm not sure. I I don't think so. Because uh, yeah, that would be a, the approximation with maybe a dozen balls or so. Would be very very possibly, low rate. Possibly, yeah. yeah. Uh, we haven't tried that. So, um, I have a question. So basically, uh -huh. you're trying to estimate the dimensionality by the slope of this line of this graph, right? Of the yeah of the of the uh, right of this um, of the testing um, sequence quantizer. Yeah, so, the slope. So is the graph on the right the slope 
of the graph on the left at the Yeah, bottom. yeah, that, that's right. And so how do you measure slope? Well, we just do a local linear fit. Okay. Um, and, and this is interesting. So what happens here is that you see testing, um, the testing uh, quantizer slope goes to zero because, well, as, as we increase the rate, the quantizer starts learning a zero dimensional approximation to each individual point. But um, the test quantize, uh, quantizer um, estimate of uh, the dimension goes up. In fact, it'll, it'll estimate the extrinsic dimension because now the, um, the test quantizer just doesn't know what to do. So it'll try to estimate, it'll try to look for points everywhere, not just even on the manifold. So uh, a couple more things. So why is this wiggly? Um, of the slope. Um, I mean, on the graph on the left, mm -hmm. you fit into this nice, smooth thing that has, uh, you know, whose who's oh, right. derivatives are, you know, probably monotonic. Mon well, uh, right. Um, this could do with the fact that we're just doing a local linear fit. So, um, and plus, these are, I believe, um, averaged curves. So, um, frankly, I don't remember why this came up. We have an explanation of this in our paper, actually, uh, what's happening here. Um, I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I don't remember. Uh, is, uh, is this rate in bits? Yeah, yeah this is rate in bits. So, <coughs> 2 to the 10th would be like a 1,000 points through this. Right. right. And you're saying that at those rates, you're looking like zero dimensionality or something? Why did that happen? Um, well, it's not just the question of rates. It's a question of training ratio. And since we did a five-fold um, cross-validation setup, uh, the training set size is actually 4,000. Okay. So. Oh, I see. Yeah. And, um, all right. So also at those rates, like how many twists do you have in this toroidal spiral? Uh, about 40, I think. So, we get like, 50, like 20, I guess 20 points. Okay. Right. So, so this sort of ba um, bears out the, the, the sort of rule of thumb that you need a constant number of bits per each dimension. Since, so, <clears throat> uh, that will be exponential in the intrinsic dimension. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't remember the answer to, to this um, non sort of wiggly behavior of the slope estimate. Um, well, this has to do with the fact that the fits, um, they so do tend to deteriorate closer to, to high rates, uh, especially for the, for the test error. But at least we get a nice qualitative, um, qualitatively correct prediction that uh, the, the training uh, distortion will just zero in, zero in on, the, on the individual training points, and, 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 and that'll cause the, the test distortion to just jump. Uh, they become higher. Um, and then um, we consider the limit of our scheme as this distortion exponent goes to infinity. And um, because m is compact, um, this limit as um, r goes to infinity of this quantizer error exists for any k point quantizer. And it equals the worst case um, Euclidean error of this quantizer. And so it's independent of the distribution of the data. <coughs> it just depends on the geometric um, um, structure of the manifold. And, uh, and when I look at the optimum of this um, worst case error over all k-point quantizers, and this is actually the nice um, geomet geometric um, property of this manifold. It's the smallest radius of the most economical covering of, of this manifold by k a fewer balls. In other words, um, I look at, you know, uh, I fix k, and then I and I look at how small I can make uh, a, a, a covering radius um, <clears throat> if I cover the, the manifold by k a few balls. So there's a, a, a kind of a trade-off because if I make k really small, this um, radius I'll have to make it larger. So I have to find some intermediate uh, value of the number of um, size of the covering between zero and k, and then you know to make this radius smaller. Uh, so um, one way of estimating the dimension, and it's been done in the literature, is to use the covering numbers. And the covering number n m of epsilon is just um, the minimum number of balls of radius epsilon that can cover this manifold m. And it turns out that this so-called capacity dimension also equals the intrinsic dimension of the manifold. And um, so we compare this to um, 
to this um, Oracle's infinity quantizer error. And we see that these actually correspond. You can, you can prove it by a, a geometric argument. Um, <clears throat> but the heuristic explanation is that this um, covering number plays the role of quantizer rate. And um, the covering radius plays the role of worst case quantizer error. And therefore, these definitions are more or less equivalent than the method we would use to find the intrinsic uh, dimension in uh, the Oracle's infinity regime is, in fact, similar or equivalent to the method used by, um, by um, Kegel, in, uh, uh, published in NIPS 03, um, for estimation using the packing or covering numbers. So that was nice. I mean, our scheme and the limit yielded um, a scheme that, that was already published, uh, published before. And um, however, well, there are, there are advantages and disadvantages to, um, to picking various values of the distortion exponent r. So when, when r equals, equals 2, we just have the squared error distortion. And uh, you just use the standard k-means algorithm to design our quantizers. It's all very nice, very efficient, and quick. And we can just um, <coughs> get away with uh, fairly simple algorithms. As r increases, uh, the centroid step becomes harder. It's a non-convex non optimization problem in general. And so we can't just reduce it to the, to the, you know, to the centroid with respect to the uh, centroid in the sense of the uh, conditional expectation over the region. It's going to be much more complicated than that. Higher moments play a role. And therefore, um, <coughs> this makes the R equals 2 preferred choice in terms of implementation. Um, on the other hand, the R equals infinity, as I've shown, um, the quantizer error is independent of the distribution. So R equals infinity case will be robust to sampling density. So we can, in fact, relax the regularity assumption. Um, it's but soup, like a soup norm? Yeah, it's like a soup norm, exactly. Uh, the centroid would be just uh, the middle. Uh, the centroid, well, no, the centroid is sort of determined by the minimum enclosing ball of, of yeah. But finding min minimum closing balls is, uh, I mean, it looks like it, there But it's just in each dimension. You take each dimension separately, right? Just find the min, the mass, and just cut it in half, and that would be um, Well, it's a bit more complicated. And, well, something like that. But the complexity of that is basically, um, I think it's factorial in the extrinsic dimension by a randomized algorithm. So I mean, it becomes really intractable to do that. And it's factorial in the extrinsic dimension. It's, it's just really prohibitive. So um, what we did instead, we implemented a greedy method, which is something s similar to what you suggested. That we find, um, we, we draw a point at random from, from the training sample, and we find the point that's, that's farthest from it. And then we find the, the point whose maximum, um, whose maximum distance from all the, uh, the code words selected so far is minimized. So it's a greedy method that's similar to what Kangle used. But it results in this kind of jagged, um, um, jagged curve for the um, for the, the test distortion. I mean, uh, this this uses a Lloyd algorithm with the randomized minimum enclosing ball step, which is slow. But these curves are sort of visually coincident, so we decided to implement the greedy method. Um, this is for the test error. For the training error, of course. Um, you know, the uh, minimum closing ball thing uh, works very smoothly. But once you do the test there, the problem is that this worst case, is control, uh, worst case error is controlled by outliers. So uh, it could be that over several iterations, it's just, it just picks the same outlier over and over and over. And that's why um, we've got this jagged behavior. We had to smooth it over a bit. So, um, but, but we decided to go with the greedy algorithm, nonetheless, for implementation um, efficiency. Um, well, and next we have to address the effect of noise. So what happens is if there's additive noise in the data, what you're really approximating then is not the quantizer distortion of the clean data, but the quantizer distortion for the noisy data. And strictly speaking, if the, if the noise is high dimensional, like the additive Gaussian noise, now this distribution of the data is no longer singular continuous. And in fact, absolutely continuous. And its quantization dimension is then equal to the extrinsic dimension. But <clears throat> since we're in a finite rate regime, we can still capture the intrinsic dimension with an error. And the error will be controlled by the strength of the noise. So in order to ascertain that, we um, made use of the quantizer mismatch formalism, which basically tells you, well, if I design a quantizer for a particular distribution and optimize it, then, um, well, if I run it on another distribution, that'll be suboptimal. But how 
by how much will the errors differ. And it uh, turns out we can bound this error difference by this so-called Wasserstein distance. And this is um, of order r, so for the given distortion exponent. So we just look at all pairs x and y jointly distributed such that the marginals of x and y are correspondingly the clean and the noisy distribution. And just um, look at this um, expectation and minimize it over all these choices x, y. And this is, in fact, uh, you know, Euclidean version of the row bar distance of uh, Gray Newhoff and Shields. Right? And, and it turns out we can bound this error, um, estimation error for the distortion in terms of this. So now we took a nice computable example, and in fact, considered uh, in uh, manifold learning when we have added isotropic Gaussian noise. So we just corrupt each component, each coordinate by a zero mean. Um, constant variance noise, uh, Gaussian, and then just add. And then, um, so to bound this, we just notice that x minus y is just this Gaussian w. And therefore, this Wasserstein distance will be bounded from above by uh, the um, rth root of the rth moment of, of w. And that's just, uh, you have to do some stuff with, um, with gamma random variables and obtain this bound. So as you can see, this is the standard deviations of noise. This is the extrinsic dimension. This is the uh, distortion exponent. And this expression goes, um, grows uh, without bound with all the three parameters, with the noise strength, the extrinsic dimension, and distortion exponent. And um, for um, r equals 2, this bound just looks like this. It's just the um, square root of the variance and the extrinsic dimension product. Um, <clears throat> so that gives us a, a good idea of where we can be if, if there's noise. So really, we're, we have no, we have no um, rigorous guarantee that we're going to estimate the, uh, the intrinsic dimension because, well, because we're no longer in the singular continuous regime. But at least we can sort of see by how, by how much we can be off. And to test that, we um, embedded the same Swiss roll in dimensions from 3 to, I believe, 8, and added noise of varying strength, and plotted. Um, the effect of this on the, on the test and training um, dimension estimates for r equals 2, I think, and r equals infinity. Uh, and we can see that um, the, uh, the test estimate is fairly stable in uh, low noise, low extrinsic dimension, and then it climbs up with uh, increasing both. But the r equals infinity estimates are, well, fairly jagged due to this uh, outlier sensitivity. And when there's noise, there are more outliers generated by the noise. So this, again, speaks in favor of r equals 2 um, method. And we here plotted also the differences between the, um, so this is a theoretical, the Wasserstein bound for, um, for um, the estimation error for the quantizer distortion. And this is the empirical differences. So we see that the dependence on, um, uh, on sigma and on d, at least the functional form is, is, is captured more or less by, um, by these. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, that's kind of um, on top is the empirical difference. On the bottom is the bound. I, mean, I, I can't see really well. So uh, top the, is the empirical difference. So it's below the bound, but the functional form is still the same. It's more or less um, linear in sigma and um, square root in the extrinsic dimension. So this confirms. Uh, um, up to a, a multiplicative constant, the validity of this, of this bound for us. And so we, we can now assess how much noise will corrupt our, our estimates. And um, finally, we ran this also on some real data, uh, handwritten digits from the MNIST database. So on top, we have some representative samples. And on the um, FACES data set from Brendan Fry, um, well, with this real data, we really don't know what the intrinsic dimension is. All we can do is just for example, look at our estimates across the different digits and try to see whether they capture the variability and the degrees of freedom available in these, um, in these various digits. And we can also compare it with some baseline. So we chose the baseline regression method, which works as follows. It takes each training point and then um, draws a small ball around it and counts the number of, say, kth nearest neighbors, uh, and, uh, or rather looks at kth nearest neighbors determines the radius of the ball, and then looks at the growth uh, of that with, um, <coughs> with k, I believe. 
that? Sorry, so that's used by, uh, that was used by Matthew Brand in his paper on charting a manifold in NIPS 2003. And this method is, uh, and, uh, this method is um, known for its uh, negative bias. So uh, these are the regression estimates. And these are the r equals 2 and r equals infinity estimates. Uh, I'm going to get closer here to sort of discuss this. So uh, we notice that the r equals 2 estimates are consistently the highest. Uh, among the regression, r equals 2 and r equals infinity, which suggests that we <coughs> might be solving, the, alleviating most of the sources of bias. And also, if you look, for example, the smallest estimate we get is for ones, because there's not that much degree of freedom uh, variation in, in ones. And um, the estimate for, um, for eights, I believe, is the highest, because in eights you can have all sorts of different self-intersections and loops, and you know, and here you have a disconnected feature and slanting and all sorts of things. So eight is by far the most complicated digit. Um, it's fairly high for sevens, because in the seven you can have um, these sharp corners, and also, I guess, Eastern Europeans tend to draw a horizontal bar in a seven. So I mean, that's how in Russia we were taught to write a seven in school. And you know, for example, Americans will write a seven like this or like this. Um, and with zeros, you also get some variability because there are various loops and uh, you know lines through the zero and so on and so forth. So uh, at least heuristically, we can we can assume that um, our method captures some meaningful um, meaningful sort of parametric structure of this data set. For faces. Um, we got 8.3. Uh, Matthew Brand used the same data, data set, but he cut it down to 500 frames. And he got a dimension estimate, I believe, of um, 5. But he cut it down to 500 frames. And he also added some additional symmetries. Here we use the full almost 2,000 frames. And there's definitely sufficient number of degrees of freedom in these facial expressions and pose and lighting to suggest this 8.3 plus additional sanity check to the, this dimension might have something to do with the truth is the finding in um, quantitative psychology that there are nine uh, action groups of muscles responsible for facial expressions. You can in fact quantify their strengths. In fact, I'm, I'm going to mention it uh, in connection with some um, planned work. So, um, were, were they making all different faces in the data set? I doubt it. I mean, it was just one, well, it was just one, one person, Brendan Fry. I don't think uh, a single person is you know, capable of that much of an expressive range to be able to spontaneously cap make all sorts of facial expressions. Now, was was Brendan also turning his head, or was it just staying? I think he was turning his head a little bit. Because that would add more dimensions to it. Oh, definitely, yeah. And plus camera jitter, and you know, that, that, that uh, definitely. Uh, obviously, um, we, we wouldn't expect to get the entire nine um, dimensional range of the facial expressions, but at least uh, it's not something that wildly overestimates. Um, so just to summarize, I think this um, use of an independent test set is, um, is what's most responsible for negative bias uh, avoidance. And we believe that other methods, if they also used an independent test set, would um, be able to avoid most of the bias as well. I we don't know why uh, nobody used the test set, but they don't. And uh, the reason why we used it well because it was dictated by basically empirical quantizer design. That's how you assess the quality of the quantizer on, once you design it. And uh, the limiting case, R equals infinity, uh, is, based, is equivalent to a previous method based on packing numbers. So uh, that was a nice bonus of our approach. And um, the rate that yields a dimension estimate is actually the rate at which um, the data must be compressed to ensure that the quantizer cells correspond to locally, locally low-dimensional neighborhoods in the manifold. In other words, if you look at the um, Swiss roll, um, then the quantizer cells uh, will be such that they won't cross across several sheets of this um, of this roll. They'll just stay on these um, on those low dimensional surface because, well, if it's a high rate approximation, it won't have any uh, need to quantize the empty space around the manifold. So that gives us a nice way of once we determine the rate at which the dimension estimate um, at which we should obtain the dimension estimate, that gives us the rate at which we should quantize the data to, to get some nice geometrically faithful um, code book structure. And finally, um, was to, just to plug uh, my previous work, um, this can be integrated with a quantization-based 
technique for nonlinear dimensionality reduction, which is once we know what the intrinsic dimension is, let's reconstruct the low dimensional parametric representation. So I presented this uh, in Adelaide this um, September at the Information Theory Symposium. Uh, and it's based also on vector quantization. But um, what's being quantized, what the code book now consists of Gaussian components, of Gaussian models. And what we do is it's a variable rate quantizer that obtains a Gaussian mixture model. It's similar to EM, but it's a hard clustering method. Uh, but it has a complexity regularization term to ensure that different components located at different, uh, at nearby um, points in the manifold have very similar covariance matrix eigenvectors. So the subspaces spanned by the covariance matrices of nearby line components are um, also almost coincident. So this enforces a global geometric coherence on the manifold and also gives us a nice uh, local adaptation as well. Uh, and so this would be similar to say, you know, if you, if you were to compare this to speech coding, you would look basically at the variation of the um, filter parameters between the different frames, and you would try to hit the, uh, to fit a, it's like a hidden Markov model to uh, the change of state between the frames. And uh, the regularization term looks like a hidden Markov model um, uh, noise term in that the, the idea is that we can think of a noisy channel that can perturb each local coordinate system to a nearby, a nearby line coordinate system with high probability and our, our quantization should be able to survive that channel. And so, and we in fact plan to uh, apply this to modeling of natural sequences of facial expressions. So in other words, take that nine dimensional manifold of, of human faces and, and um, a hypothesis advanced by a faculty member in our um, psychology department, Jesse Spencer Smith is that natural sequences of facial expressions correspond to geodesics on this manifold. And if we can if you construct the geodesics, the Riemannian structure, which in fact I, uh, this uh, method uh, suggested here can do, and we're currently putting finishing touches on the implementation of this. So uh, the geodesics are done, done by dynamic programming. I, it can do this, and therefore we can think of even um, trying to implement some sort of you know, intelligent uh, emotionally meaningful computer interface with, uh, with a, a human face changing expressions in a natural fashion. So the, the users will perceptually um, experience something that's uh, uh, <coughs> something that changes expressions in, in a natural way. So that there's no, we try to avoid the uncanny effects. Uh, so we'll see how that, how that um, goes on. And now um, the final slide is uh, an even more shameless attempt at self-promotion. Uh, I just described the current project I'm working on uh, as a Beckman Fellow. So um, another big pro project that I, I work on, uh, and part of it is um, done with um, uh, Pierre Moulin in um, the Electrical Engineering Department, um, is um, try to merge the learning theoretic techniques with um, information theoretic techniques to design compression systems or data um, um, transmission systems that are intelligent in the sense that, well, Depending on application, there, you might not just want to compress the data, but also to be able to model it. And uh, so, for example, when you do lossless compre compression, things like arithmetic codes or uh, um, uh, Shannon Fano codes or Huffman codes are also modeling uh, techniques because they give you a nice uh, sort of model for the probability distribution. And uh, I was trying to extend that to, um, to lossy codes, actually. Um, so when you have um, continuous variable data and you want to compress it but also be able to, to model it as well. So um, I just finished and submitted a paper on this. Uh, and we plan to apply this to things like media forensics where um, information has been distributed to multiple agents and they perform some processing on it. And this processing will be captured in a parametric form of some distribution. And then we want to compress the data once, you know, so we, we gather the data back from them. We want to compress the data in such a way that f we can reconstruct the data with near optimal fidelity, but also to be able to say what they did to the data while, while it was in their possession. Another project is uh, um, it's a collaboration with a faculty member from the uh, neuroscience department, Tom Anastasio. And um, he has a hypothesis that high, um, sort of spatially organized uh, neurons in the brain um, are not related to any conscious processing. In other words, um, you d um, visual cortex organization is not there, so you consciously experience visual scene um, 
geometry that's done by other stages, by say, you know, V2, V3 visual cortex, but the V1 representation is spatial because the brain wants to cope with neuron noise, which is not removable. So um, it tries to do something like um, what's known in information theory as Feinstein coding, which is channel coding but tied to a particular input um, statistics in such a way that you can split the output space into disjoint regions and be able to identify, uh, associate each region with a particular input in such a way that the probability of error is small. So we have a conjecture at which we're going to try uh, address by theory and by simulations that, in fact, the topographic regions in these maps are, in fact, these um, optimal encoding regions. And the neurons that represent the same um, modality tend to be develop strong lateral connections and neurons that are located in opposite, um, oppositely encodable states uh, develop weak lateral connections. And finally, uh, this is a remnant from my PhD work, which was in quantum, quantum information theory. It's trying to marry quantum cryptography and game theory. You see, quantum cryptography, which is, I guess, the most exciting and most practical at this point, application of quantum information theory, um, the security of the protocols hinges on the two parties being able to detect how much disturbance the attacker has introduced and therefore deduce from that how much uh, information they could possibly eavesdrop on. Um, problem with intrusion, intrusion level detection is that, well, it'll probably destroy the coherent quantum superpositions that are necessary for the system to even work. And um, <clears throat> we believe that this also leaves unaccounted for uh, issues related with side information because the attacker can in fact listen in on you know, public leaks, change the information between the parties and can combine that with um, their quantum measurements to, to, to determine more information that, that we can really ascribe to them. So that's why uh, the idea is to use game theory so that intrusion level detection is, is not necessary but in fact you, you do this in sort of a, a saddle point fashion. And this is in fact inspired by uh, work of uh, Pierre Milan and Giorgio O'Sullivan on classical information hiding and uh, there's a game theoretic expression for the data hiding capacity and we hope to extend it to um, quantum um, cryptographic schemes. So that's sort of the range of um, things that I'm I engaged at uh, the Beckman Institute. So okay. Thanks. Thank you. Modeling of the digits and also, but how do you do what, what does the exact number uh, mean for you? Of the dimension or of the? Oh. <coughs> well, we don't. Oh, you mean like what the true number is? Yeah, There's no way to know. That's that's that that's the weak part of these data sets. We just have to play it by ear. I mean, the way I can think of how to make sure that we're doing something right is to go through a full nonlinear dimensionality reduction step and then reconstruct it back to the high dimensional space and see what the error is. If the error is low, we're doing something right. So for something like this, the input space, the high dimensional space, is the grid of ink. Right? Yeah. So it's a, That's right. what is it, a 60 by 80 or? No, this is, um, these are 28 by 28 actually. Okay, so 28 by 28 real values. Yeah. No, these I think, no, these are um, black and white, I believe. Okay, so 28 by 28 binary, binary values yeah. range this way. But, but if I had, I could do a generative model for something which was that's right. say, a tilted O, mm -hmm. which just required <coughs> an ellipse of a particular size, location, and, and tilt, right, which I could probably characterize with, you know, four dimensions or something like that. Right, but then there's a when line. You, and the, right. right, but when you put it into this, into this space, do you think it would still come up with a number four, or is it because you've embedded? In other words, there's there's nothing short of an actual algorithm that would map from from my representation. You have to write a drawing algorithm mm -hmm. that maps into the space. So, does this thing really capture the smallest possible thing if you applied an arbitrary algorithm, or just the one that is kind of you know the obvious stuff in this multi-dimensional space? I think it looks for the obvious stuff more or less. I mean, if you want to get really really sophisticated. Um, I think I already mentioned the Jeff Hinton's mm -hmm. uh, poster at right. NIPS. Yeah. They were developing motor programs. So, you know, his main thing is that, you know, the, the vision and graphics uh, tasks are more or less inverses of each other. Mm -hmm. And he, he was trying to sort of use one to bootstrap on the other and develop these motor programs for um, generating handwritten digits and sort of drawing the competence island around the manifold. And that's how you get all sorts of possible variations of the handwritten digits. Mm -hmm. So. Um, 
with a generative model, yeah, possibly you could be you would be able to be constructed. Here, of course, there's noise and all sorts of artifacts, and you're you're probably modeling them as well. So, it would be interesting to run some sort of a denoising scheme before doing the reduction, and possibly you might hit on you know sufficiently low uh, number co correspond to some like the informal you know heuristic dimension that we can think. Well, of. it would be interesting just to try a simple example, <coughs> where, you know, like all ellipses that you. Can yeah, that would be interesting, right? Because there you can, you know, you can just look at it and say, I can reproduce an ellipse by its centroid and two major axes, you know. That's that right. That's right. Or five. And then you run it through the algorithm in a noise-free case and see what it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then because the question is, well, well, does that look sufficiently like a handwritten digit? Because, I mean, no, it's, a, it's a different perceptually. Whether you're, not whether it applies to handwritten digits, but whether your measure of intrinsic dimensionality oh, I see. You can capture really corresponds to the sort of the Turing machine, you know, the, 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 the lowest possible dimensionality that you could encode it's if you have right. an arbitrary machine. Right. Oh, so this is already so something like, you know, hitting on the Kolmogorov complexity exactly. type um, yes. things. Well, I mean, you, you know, of course, that there are s most sequences are incompressible in the sense that the Kolmogorov complexity equals the, um, the entropy rate. Right. So, I mean, there are information theoretic uh, considerations, but... But there are certain sequences like the bit patterns generated by Adobe PostScript mm -hmm. you know, correspond to the time zone and font that are incredibly, you know, compressible. Right, right. Uh, well, that's because they're deterministic. Ones. Right. So, um, yeah, it's a good question. It's something to think about and something to sort of, you know, again, try and um, see how our system works in, in these environments. Yeah. So definitely something to look into. Okay, thanks a lot. Oh. Wait, wait, is this off already or?